Open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 1. Doing a series on the book of Acts, and I have full confidence that I'm actually going to start chapter 1, verse 1, before the end of March. <laughs> I have, I have, I'm confident. Before the end of March. But I'm not promising I'll finish this book before I turn 50. That I'm not promising. Are you there? Good. It starts off by Luke, the writer of the book, is a wonderful man. He's a doctor. And somehow he's connected with, uh, with the apostles. And he said, in my former book, Theophilus, it's this guy's trying to convince. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Do you remember John the Baptist had also said some time ago, that I baptize with water, but he, when he comes, will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You remember? In this context, however, Jesus doesn't mention the fire. He just mentions the filling of the Spirit. Because what Jesus is trying to tell us is that when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you get it all at the same time. You get refreshing and you get purification. You get power and you get healed. When the Holy Spirit starts to work in your life, do you understand you don't get a portion of the Spirit? You get Him. What you have to learn is to walk with him more. If you've ever had a friend, besides one who has like false legs and false arms and stuff, if you invite a friend into your home, did you know that the whole friend arrives? <laughs> Amazing. As I said, except the ones with falsies, because they can leave some outside. I've got a terrible joke about that. I don't know if you want to hear it. I don't know if it's a good idea. Maybe it's not. <laughs> okay, back to the notes. <clears throat> Someone comes to visit you, and you're, you're dying to hear it, eh? I'm dying to tell it. <laughs> I've worked out a thing with the elders, because occasionally, I mean, it doesn't happen very often, once every three or four years, I say something I shouldn't. <laughs> it's true, eh? Every three or four years, I say something I shouldn't. And... Uh, so I was away with the elders this weekend, and they, one of the things we're looking at are doing is doing Apple, uh, 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 Facebook Live. We're going to try and get that up by next week. So what it means is people are on in Johannesburg or on a church, get onto Facebook and watch the preach live. The one big dilemma we have is that if we do YouTube videos, Wayne is free to delete and cut out my stuff. <laughs> That's not helpful. <clears throat> on Facebook Live, however, the moment I've said it, it's there which means all the human rights lawyers can phone me and start making plenty cash. So what we've decided is that if I'm approaching a space that's not helpful, some of the elders are going to do the following. They're just going to raise their hands as if they're agreeing with me, but they're actually saying, stop now. And then it's my choice whether I jump over that particular fence or not. And hands did go up all over the place. So I will honor that and not tell my joke. But if you want to hear it, Catch me afterwards. <laughs> Maybe I'll kick it off before the evening meeting time. Anyway, <clears throat> so when the Holy Spirit comes, He comes in His totality. What we need, the problem we have, honestly, is that we can't cope with Him. And He knows we can't. There's too much. He's too much. He's, he's, he is the power of God. God the Father, God the Son, are in heaven right now. God the Holy Spirit is with us. When Jesus said, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you, that's what He meant. He meant, I will put my Spirit within you. You have the latent power of the Holy Spirit living inside you every minute of every day. You are not alone. Can, can I say this? If the Bible says greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, what it means is that you are literally, literally unstoppable. You. Can I say this? You are literally unconquerable. You. Because greater is he who is in you. 
than who's in the world. The difference is getting you to believe what the Bible already says is true about you. Because often you are shaped by the world, your mindset changes, and you begin to believe that stuff. And it's very difficult then to allow the Word of God through the Holy Spirit to retell you who you are, which is why Romans 12 starts by telling us we need to renew our minds. Because when you start thinking correctly by the Spirit of God, you literally become unstoppable as a Christian. Your faith doesn't waver. And all this happens by the Holy Spirit, if you like, who lives within you, next to you, around you. If you can imagine yourself totally enveloped by the person of the Spirit. And what we have to learn to do over time is how to walk with Him, how to respond to Him, how to obey Him. Even right now, I'm sure you're aware of His presence, right now. But it's learning how, because what happens is, as you walk with the Holy Spirit, same as getting to know somebody, the, the more time you spend with them, the more you explore them, the better you get to know them, the more you experience them. Right? So it is with Him. And the more we press in and get to know Him, the more we discover that He is literally the power of God. That He dwells within us. Something in your thinking, shackles, can begin to come off. That you are not a brow-beaten Christian. You're actually here to cause trouble for the enemy. Not to cause trouble for yourself. And that's where we need to make the change. And you discover in the book of Acts, Paul... Um, uh, Luke writes to this guy Theophilus and he says, listen, when, I want to tell you about what Jesus began to do and to teach until he was taken up. Do you remember that after his suffering, he appeared to many people, gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Then it says, and he taught them about the kingdom of God. You see, God comes to establish a kingdom. For those of you who know history, you would know that wherever a kingdom came into a foreign country, just think quickly, what was the first things they did? When the Greeks arrived, before them the Macedonians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, now it's the Americans. <laughs> Be honest. Be honest. What do they bring? They bring their culture. They bring their laws. They bring their ways. And they supersede yours. You learn the language of the oppressor. That's how it's always been. And so Jesus comes and says, he began to teach about the kingdom of God. What's he telling us? There is a language. There is a culture. There are laws. There are ways of this kingdom. That, and he has the problem for the world and for the devil. Any human being who picks this up and starts to recognize that they can know Jesus, they can start to establish the kingdom wherever they are by simply changing their language their culture, their laws, and their ways. So you find yourself in a place where the enemy doesn't know what to do because the word of the Lord goes out, a whole lot of people take it and own it, and we become unstoppable, and we're in the majority as it is, and Jesus is fighting for us, and it's going to work. If the language of the church and the mindset of the church would just change, planet Earth will shift in a couple of years. Instead of you now thinking, oh, Lord, even getting up today was hard. We live defeated when we shouldn't. The language of Scripture is very different. Jesus was fully under the impression that when he left the earth, the disciples were to continue to do exactly what he'd been doing. The difference was they needed the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And these were people that already received the Holy Spirit, that already healed the sick, that already opened the eyes of the blind, that already seen dead people brought back to life. And still then, Jesus had already breathed the Spirit on them, and he says to them, now you wait because there is a corporate anointing. There is a corporate filling of the Holy Spirit that you need to receive. What's he trying to tell us? That when the Spirit comes corporately upon a people, he equips us for works of service. And I want to go there this morning. Because I want to start looking at when Paul's, Paul's theology on the Holy Spirit, what does it mean? What happens? How do we respond to him? Because every one of us in this room needs more of the Holy Spirit. You cannot have enough of the Holy Spirit. How much of God do you need? All of him. Can you, can you ever reach a place where you've got enough? Of course not. So let's look at some of the powerful and emotive language surrounding the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 44 verse 3. For I will pour water on the, on the thirsty land 
and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. Wow. And I will pour my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Stop right there. What's the promise of Scripture right there? Who's dry? Who's thirsty? For the things of God right now, he says, I will find you. And I will pour out my spirit on you. Now the challenge in this is this isn't something you can do by yourself. You need him and his presence. You need his power. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. Aren't we trusting God to touch our kids? To minister to our children by the Holy Spirit. He says, I will pour out my blessing on your descendants. I don't know about you, but I want my kids and their kids to walk in blessing because I'm a Christian. Because I follow Jesus, I want there to be a blessing that flows through to my own grandchildren. But I can't do that. He can. And so right away, you have the Holy Spirit saying, I'm going to come into a meeting like this. I want to find everybody here who's thirsty. I want to find everybody here who's dry. Everybody here in need of a blessing. I want to find you. And I want to begin to pour water and streams out upon you right now. Take another scripture, Ezekiel 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to follow, uh, to keep all my laws. What's happening here? Who's feeling dirty? Who's feeling unclean? Who's feeling like the weight of the world is sitting on you? You've been walking through mud and through sewage. You want to please God. You know you're not clean. And as you try and get clean and you don't have water, what happens when you wipe the stuff? All you do is spread it. And you're saying, God, I need more. How many of you sitting here this morning with a stone cold heart saying, I know it's right and I can't do it. I know what I need to do, but I can't. I'm living in a place where wrong is more right than right for me. My heart is stone cold. God says, I will find you. If you're dirty, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. If you've got idols in your life, there are things God wants you to do. Wants you to walk in and you know them, but you have these little besetting things that keep holding you back. They're actually idols. You bow to those instead of to him. He's saying, I want to just remove them from you. I want to just take them out of the way. I will remove your idols. That stone cold heart of yours, bring it to me. I'll change it. What will the result be at the end of the day? I will move you to keep my laws. You know what? I won't even expect you to obey me by yourself. I'll even help you do that by the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, interestingly, some of the words that came this morning, and nobody here knows what I'm preaching. They don't know my scriptures. They don't know anything. And look at the words that come. The one is, if you're struggling, if you're this, if you're that, God says, I'm right there, and I want to rain upon you. The other one said, you're playing with little fires. They're becoming big fires. You're running into trouble. What does God say? I've seen that. I've seen that uncleanness. I want to deal with it this morning. These people don't know the scriptures I'm bringing. Do you see how God appears and he starts to do things the way he wants to do it, when he wants to do it. And we have come to meet with him, so then for goodness sake, let's meet with him. Joel two, chapter 2, verse 28. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on a few really willing people. Wait, 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 sorry. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on those who come to two out of three services on a Sunday. No, it doesn't, right? I'm trying to get it because I'm interpreting it according to what I see. And afterward, I'll pour my spirit upon the few that sit near the front row. <laughs> and afterward, I'll pour my spirit on those who feel worthy, called, holy, and special. Funny, the Bible says, and afterward I'll pour out my spirit on all people. 
Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now he's saying, I want to pour out my spirit upon every single Christian. Listen, regardless of your qualification. Regardless of how holy you feel right now, how capable you feel, how able you feel. I want to do it for all of you. Now, not all believers experienced the Holy Spirit at the same time. Not all believers experienced the Holy Spirit at the same occasion. Not all believers experienced the Holy Spirit the same way. We don't know. I want to tell you this morning that no two people experience the Holy Spirit the same way, in the same way that no two people have the same relationship as to others. God is unfathomable. And why I'm saying that to you is you can't say, because so-and-so's walk with God looks like this, means I don't have one. No, yours is unique. But yours can get better. Yours can get deeper. Yours can get more powerful. I'll try and get onto that this week or next week. But what you need to understand is that God says to you that your relationship with Him will be unique and He wants to pour out His Spirit on all people. That's encouraging for me for those who feel it's time to retire. Well, I've had it. I've done it. I'm, I'm over this thing now. God says to you, actually, it's time for you, old man, to dream dreams. My boys have moved school from St. John's to Redham. And... Uh, I was walking through the campus on Friday, and I thought to myself, it's a, many years ago, old man Crawford, Bob Crawford, I was involved in a meeting with him, and he wanted to do some stuff, so he had a meeting with me, and he wanted to get involved in some stuff. He was just about to retire. He had started the Crawford Colleges. He had sold that to the Crawford Group then, or whatever group it's called. He then started the Redham Schools. It's old Bob Crawford, Christian guy from Christian Family Church. And... When I went through on Friday, I reflected, old man Crawford's been dead a few years. I wonder if he knows the impact his dreams are having and will have for the next generations simply because he dared to dream. You see, he dreamed, but those who have visions ran with his dream. Because sometimes the dreamers can't envision something other. He dreamed, they envisioned, my kids benefit today. And I want to tell you, today, God wants to put dreams in the minds of your old men and your old women. And those who are young with fire, He wants to give vision, to speak what He wants, to do what He wants. There are things, we prayed about it this Thursday night. By the way, prayer meetings for everybody. We had a great attendance on Thursday, but we need all of you there. And in the prayer meeting, we prayed through a lot of this, that God wants to start speaking opportunities to us. God wants to start giving opportunities to His people that you'd never have thought of on your own. And all you need to do, we'll get on to it now, is to learn to receive from the Holy Spirit. Believers could experience the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation before they were even water baptized. Acts 10, 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They received the Holy Spirit just as we have, so he ordered they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, you'll see what happens straight away. Peter's speaking to Gentiles, and he's still preaching the gospel. While he's still talking, people start talking in tongues, getting baptized in the Spirit in the room. Why? Because they're open to receive. Now, water baptism, of course, is a sign. It is an emblem. It's a, it's a signature statement of something that's already happened. But spirit baptism happens in the moment. These people are empowered by God as they're hearing a salvation message. He has, he has some guys who get filled with the spirit after water baptism. Acts 19, verse 5 and 6. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So Peter's telling people about Jesus. While he's still speaking, they get filled with the Spirit. Paul, on the other hand, tells them they need to be saved. They get saved. They get water baptized. They come out. He prays for them. They then get filled with the Spirit. Do you see the Spirit isn't particularly picky as to when he comes? Paul received the Holy Spirit within a short time of his salvation. 
Acts 9, verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got up and was baptized. So here is someone, Saul of Tarsus, breathing out threats against the church, goes blind. Jesus says, I'm going to save you. And Ananias the prophet comes, ministers to him. His eyes are open. He gets full of the Spirit and gets water baptized. Wham, bam. Then you get some who receive the Holy Spirit after a while. You see that in Acts 8 verse 12. When they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers, which means they're saved, that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So now you've got people who received the Holy Spirit. They got saved. The message gets out. The apostles come, lay hands on them, and they get saved. Paul gets saved and fulfilled the Holy Spirit. These guys hear the gospel, and weeks later, someone comes and says, hey, I want to tell you more about the Holy Spirit. Bang. They receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Some people receive the Holy Spirit on more than one occasion. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All of them, including all the apostles. In chapter 4, verse 8, Peter, who was part of the all in chapter 2, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. Chapter 4, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So Peter is part of, in Acts chapter 2, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, he gets up to preach, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. He gets into jail. The others are praying for him. They get refilled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 9, verse 17, and Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands. You suddenly see there, he gets filled. Chapter 13, verse 9, Saul called Paul, filled with the Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, Paul filled the Spirit in, in Acts chapter 13. Now you discover, not only can the Holy Spirit be poured out at different times, you now discover he can be poured out upon the same person and same people on different occasions. Now you need to remember, we need to separate these. When you get saved, you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, sorry, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's with you from the day you get saved until the day you see Jesus in glory. It is the Holy Spirit who looks after you. He's a seal. He holds you. He saves you for that day. He takes you to heaven. You have the Holy Spirit. But Jesus made clear to his disciples there is another event called the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And why was the infilling of the Holy Spirit given? The infilling of the Holy Spirit was given to the church for their acts of service. So that we would be useful in the world. So that we would bring the kingdom of God to bear in the world. And so this morning, if you're in this place and you know you're saved, you know you believe in Jesus, but you're lacking in power, the reality is sometimes you just need a refilling of the Holy Spirit so that you can do the task God's called you to. And you need to understand that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive, you're going to be filled with the Spirit and with fire. So God is going to fill you with a refreshing and an ability to do His will. At the same time, excuse my language, He's going to sort out all the beep in your life. He's going to get in there and start to sort that stuff out. And if you ever put your hand near a fire, it burns. It's sore. It's okay. Because it cleans. It purifies. And if God sticks you in, God knows when to take you out. Trust Him. And so... How do we go about this? Because the empowering of the spirits are different for everyone. What do we do? Well, four things need to happen. Number one, you need to be saved. You need to be regenerated, born again, converted. I was talking to the elders yesterday while we were away. And I was saying, we need to remember there are three things we need to be good at in this church. Number one is experiencing God. Number two is seeing people genuinely saved. And number three is seeing people discipled or matured into all that God has for them. Which brings up this question, well, how do you know someone has got saved? The answer is not by their words, but by their fruit. Because it's too easy to speak a language that's not backed up by the way you live. If we've got an orange tree, and I don't, but if you have an orange tree in your garden, if you're Spanish, you might. But if you have an orange tree in your garden, 
You can tell that thing it's a lemon tree till you're blue in the face. When season comes, what comes on there? Right, oranges, not kiwis, strawberries, or anything else you claimed in faith. What, what the thing is, is what's going to come out. That's it. Each reproduces after its own kind. Your talk is cheap. It's your actions. It's your fruitfulness. And we know it's called the fruit of the Spirit. So therefore, the only way you can have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, mercy, gentleness, self-control, you can only have those things if the Spirit lives in you. If you keep telling us the Spirit is in you, but you live like old fork tongue, you've got to understand maybe the Spirit isn't there. And maybe the Spirit isn't there because you might believe in Jesus like you believe in an orange tree. But unless He dwells within you by the Spirit, you can't bear fruit. So you need to be saved. So if you're saying, I want to be full of the Spirit, but your life's up to nonsense, rather try and get saved first, actually. It's a better option. If you're not sure, become sure. You surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Not just, yeah, I believe in you. It means what He says becomes the law for you. If it's written here, that's how you do it. You need to be saved. Number two, you need faith. You need to believe what the Bible says and promises regarding the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says, wait until you receive power from on high, He wants you to go, but He wants you to receive the power. You need to be in the place where you actually believe God wants to fill you with His Holy Spirit. You need faith. You've got to believe God wants to fill you with the Spirit. God wants to make you more effective. Number three, you need to keep growing in your knowledge and experience of the Holy Spirit Himself. You need to grow in your knowledge and experience of the Holy Spirit Himself. Why is that important? Because I'm telling you now, the moment we start to pray and things start to happen in the Spirit, some of you get scared. I ask you in the name of Jesus, how can you get scared when it's God? Did you know that when you die, you're going to heaven? What do you think happens there? Do you think you sit in your lazy boy and on spill your oil? No. When you get to heaven, I'm, you just start to read, I can start to read some verses for you in the book of Revelation that I don't understand. It scares me. It's too much. We're going to the place where God lives in His fullness. It doesn't matter how you've predicted what it looks like, it's the way He wants it. If I've never been to your home and you invite me, I can imagine what your home looks like. When I get there, I'm going to discover your home's the way you've decorated it. Because you like it. Same as when you come to my house. It's the way I like it. Oh, Greg, I don't like that. It's my house. <laughs> yeah, if I was you, I would, well, you, you not me. Yeah, can I move? No, you can't. Well, I don't like, then push off. It's my house. And I want to just let it right now. You and me are invited to his house. And he has set it up the way he wants it. And the fact that there's cerebrum and cherubim and four-headed creature, I mean, it's crazy. But it's there. And some of you are going to get to heaven and your first expression is. <laughs> but can I say this quickly? If you're scared, the other guy is much worse. He's much worse. So if you say, well, I, I'm scared of this thing. I'm scared of the supernatural. I'm, 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 I'm just going to walk away. You run a very real risk of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You run a very real risk of denying that the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, that caused Jesus to do the miracles he did, is the power <clears throat> wanting to be released on the church. And if you're scared of God, you're not walking in faith. Be careful. When God the Spirit starts to move, and we start to judge and criticize very quickly, at the same token, I'm saying it right now, so get it out there. Every single church has its quota of freaks. Look surreptitiously now to your left and to your right. <laughs> Try and spot them. The weirdos live among us. The problem is they don't look it. But when the Holy Spirit comes, they don't know what to do. And they start flopping around like a windmill and... Hunting on. You know what? Unless they levitate and talk in devilish tongues and take their clothes off and start doing funny stuff, outside of that, I'm okay just to let it go. Because I would rather not miss what God is doing 
then close it down because I'm scared a few of us are going to be offended when I've just told you the freaks are going to pitch up. The weirdos, I guarantee you, when the Holy Spirit starts to come, the weirdos are attracted. I have walked with the Holy Spirit for 30 years. I have walked, we have seen the Holy Spirit do stuff, and I've seen the flesh do stuff. And sometimes you've got to quietly just shut down what needs to be shut down while opening up what needs to be opened up. But if we are scared of weirdness, we might as well close the shop now. Is that okay? A friend of mine got married. That was so funny. He was in my home group. He stands like this. And he was really one who got filled with the Holy Spirit. He stands like this. And the moment anyone said the name of Jesus, he fell over. Under the power of the Spirit. Of course, when you're doing a wedding, you're talking about Christ and the bride. Where do you go except about Jesus? True story. By the end of it, the best man, the groomsman, they had him like this. He's like, look how he's on a cross. And he was gone like this. It was hilarious. And I, said, and I just want to say, in the same as Jesus, and, oh, and he would go, oh, the whole time. It's weird. I mean, you, you need to lift your spirit up. Watch the, the, your wedding video. Because no one anticipated it. So the pastor stands up. I just want to tell you all, this is a beautiful day. It's a picture of Jesus and his church. Bang, this oak's gone. He's on the floor. Pick him up. Drag him up. And he didn't even have a say. My point is, weird stuff's going to go down. It's all right. It's okay. But I will say this, that the, the spirit of the prophet is always subject to the will of the prophet. So if you start to feel God doing stuff, you can also make sure you don't get stupid. You can. So you don't run around feeling like, oh, the Lord's telling me to cluck like a chicken. No. No, no, no. No, no, no. Um, the Lord's telling me to bark like a dog. I will give you a bone. And I will tell you, go chew in the corner. But you have to grow in your knowledge and experience of the person of the Holy Spirit. And number four, critical, probably the most important besides being saved. You need to be willing to serve God wholeheartedly. You need to be willing to serve God wholeheartedly and to be obedient to his call on your life and your life to the nations. You need to be willing to obey God wholeheartedly and to serve him wholeheartedly. Stand with me, please.